Welcome to the SafeCode eLearning course, Production Penetration Testing 101. The goal of this course is to provide you with basic foundation information for security penetration testing of your products. This course is targeted at product validators. It will teach you the definition and important concepts of penetration testing, and will share some insight into common elements of an attacker's mindset. We'll also go over the use of test inputs against a target to achieve an attack against security safeguards. The material in this course is based on the assumption that you're conducting your testing within your company or have adequate permission to test the target, and you do not access public networks or use any public or external resources. Testing is typically done on restricted lab networks and on production IT systems with explicit authorization. You can supplement the material in this course with these two recommended books, Hunting Security Bugs and The Art of Software Security Assessment. As we move along through various topics within this course, we will include specific chapter references in these two books for additional reading. Now let's review the fundamentals of penetration testing. It's important to understand the difference between validation and penetration testing. Validation is typically concerned with verifying correct plan of record usages of a functional target. The general emphasis is to make it work and the focus is on using the functionality as it was intended. Penetration testing, on the other hand, is intentionally trying to induce incorrect or insecure behavior in the functional target, using whatever means necessary, including unconventional means at times. This may involve using latent functionality that is not plan of record, or even leveraging undefined behavior, or reserved or unpublished behavior. So while validation is focused on making it work, penetration testing can be seen as making it break. The security industry generally recognizes penetration testing as being a two-part process, finding a security bug and then taking advantage of the bug once found. This taking advantage of the bug is commonly referred to as exploiting the bug or penetrating the target. A classic security industry definition of penetration is a system test often part of a system certification, in which evaluators attempt to circumvent the security features of the system. In this course, the focus of penetration testing is to emphasize the bug-finding activities, rather than the exploitation activities. This is captured in the updated definition for penetration testing, which is, security activities as part of a validation effort in which pen testers, who are acting as validators, attempt to identify ways to circumvent the security objectives of the target. This updated definition achieves many goals. It works for all targets, not just systems. It recognizes the various forms of non-penetrating penetration testing activities that contribute to the overall security evaluation agenda. And it de-emphasizes the implied need to penetrate or exploit every single bug. Now, there are times when exploiting a bug still makes sense, Exploitation is particularly useful when you need to convince stakeholders of the presence or severity of a discovered security bug. Exploitation can also be useful to justify investment into security and to demonstrate appropriate security acumen. Now let's review. How does penetration testing differ from normal validation testing? Validation tends to focus on ensuring proper target functionality while penetration testing focuses on breaking that functionality by any means possible, including the use of non-plan of record elements, undefined behavior, and implementation errors. How does our penetration testing definition differ from the industry standard definition? The focus of product penetration testing emphasizes finding security bugs and de-emphasizes the exploitation of found bugs. When is it appropriate to pursue exploitation? Investing resources into creating an exploit for a found security bug may make sense when you need to prove to stakeholders the existence, impact, or severity of the bug, or when you need to demonstrate your security acumen, or justify the need for additional security resource investment. Now let's move on to some terms and concepts relating to penetration testing. A security bug is generally an implementation bug that has unintended security side effects Properly implemented architecture or designs may also have flaws that have potential security implications. All of these combined are referred to as security vulnerabilities. However, you may hear the terms vulnerability and security bug used interchangeably. 
A typical example of a security bug would be the use of an unsafe string copy function. Exploit refers to the process of taking advantage of a vulnerability. A typical example of an exploit would be a buffer overflow attack on an unsafe string copy function. Let's look at an example of a software vulnerability in some example code. This code relies on the size of STR1 always being less than the size of STR2. Do you foresee any issues with that? If the STR1 value, that is 32 bytes total, is directly copied into the memory space allocated for STR2, where only 15 bytes of memory is allocated, where does the remaining 17 bytes go? Well, in this case, it bleeds over to the adjacent space in memory and overwrites whatever is currently living in that space. We call this specific vulnerability a buffer overflow. The exploit in this case would be providing STR1 a value larger than the memory capacity allotted for STR2. The security industry recognizes different types of testing and different types of security practitioners based on a color convention. Black box testing is the form of testing where only publicly available or reverse engineered information is used to guide the testing activities. This is essentially a form of blind testing. White box testing, on the other hand, uses all available private and confidential information during the course of the testing activities. This is the traditional type of testing that's done during product validation, and it provides the tester with a breadth of material around inputs, outputs, architecture, deployments, and expected functionality. In our example on the previous slide, white box testing would provide access to the raw source code, which would allow a tester to identify the buffer overflow vulnerability. With black box testing, this vulnerability would have to be discovered through trial and error. The security industry also has a less precise notion of gray box testing, which is considered to be a type of black box testing, except that some implementation details, such as source code, are available as a partial guide for the testers to use. Security practitioners are also classified by color. Black hats are considered to be malicious attackers, while white hats are considered to be responsible security professionals. When you're performing penetration testing, it makes sense to have a measurable goal. The best place to start is to use the target's security objectives. All products going through your organization's SDL should have had security objective lists created for them. If this list doesn't exist for a product, then the need to have one should be escalated to the security champion and architects. Let's dig into the ramifications of these sample security objectives. First, access to confidential data will require all users to log in using approved authentication techniques. As a result of this objective, a tester in this scenario would not be concerned about getting access to any data not deemed confidential because that information isn't something the organization considers worthy of securing. One measure of success for the tester here would be to find a way to access confidential data without being authenticated. Next, let's take the objective that Internet-based users will not have access to run database searches. As a result of this objective, a tester would not be concerned if internal users, that is, non-Internet-based users, did have access to run searches against database content. A measure of success for the tester would be to identify ways of querying the database via Internet access. All web service products will use approved encryption techniques to protect client confidential data that is in motion between the client endpoints and the web services. As a result of this objective, a tester would not be concerned with identifying unencrypted data, such as web search terms being sent to a search engine, as long as that data was not classified as client confidential. A measure of success for the tester would be to identify ways of capturing client confidential data and either decrypting it or capturing it being transmitted in an unencrypted manner. Now, here's something important to keep in mind. The security objectives we just reviewed are merely educational examples. In practice, the tester may still be interested in capturing some of the seemingly out-of-scope items because they may provide valuable information for other attacks. Knowing the product security objectives would just help testers best focus their primary time and efforts on defeating the product's defined security objectives. Also note that these example objectives are very generic. A set of truly good security objectives is multifaceted, encompassing, and layered. Here's an interesting question. 
How should penetration testing be scoped out? What are the boundaries to the testing? To answer these questions, it's important to think with respect to the attacker. What would the attacker consider to be out of scope? And the answer is nothing. Attackers don't fabricate artificial scope boundaries. They will leverage whatever is available to meet their agenda. And you may have to think outside the box yourself. For example, software support routes for services need to be considered as a channel of attack. Let's review. What is a security vulnerability? A security vulnerability is an implementation bug, an architectural flaw or deployment flaw that has a security implication. What is the difference between white box testing and black box testing? Black box testing is a type of blind testing using only publicly available information about the target implementation. White box testing typically incorporates implementation information, source code, and other materials that may not be public knowledge. What is the measure of success during penetration testing? Compromising the target security objectives is a primary way to denote a successful penetration testing attack. To walk in the shoes of a would-be attacker, it's best to understand the mindset of security attackers. So let's have a look. As the foundation for discussing the mindset of attackers, let's first consider how they interact with a system under attack. In this example, we have a back-end database accessed by three different parties. The first group is the client customer, who accesses the database via the internet and a web server. The second group is the internal company employee who accesses it through an internal application server. And the third is an external business partner you share data with for various reasons. Each one of these entry points has an opportunity to compromise client-customer information. Typically, the attacker begins with an exploration of the system's interactions with other entities. Such entities can be software, that is processes, hardware, that is machines, or users, each such interaction is then closely investigated for weaknesses. For example, consider web application login page that accepts user credentials, ID, and password to authenticate users. It's an interaction of a system with users or entities. In this interaction, if the communication channel is not encrypted, anyone with access to the communication channel can steal credentials, which is a weakness. A working exploit for this weakness vulnerability would involve analysis of a typical login request with a web proxy. Tools could include Z Attacks Proxy or Zap, Fiddler and Burp Suite, or Network Traffic Analysis. Tools include Wireshark and TCP Dump. In exploiting a system's interactions, successful attackers share a common way of thinking about obtaining their goal. Above all else, successful attackers must be observant. Remember, they are often limited to black box testing. So observing every minor detail will help them piece together and reverse engineer the under-the-hood implementation they cannot directly look at. They also have a knack for spotting overlooked issues sitting in plain sight. Successful attackers will have to think creatively. They will take unconventional approaches to achieving their attack goal. Successful attackers must be tenacious. If they think there's a dormant security bug, they could spend days, weeks, or months working at it trying every trick in the book in order to realize and confirm the presence of the bug. Many attackers, as well as many good security practitioners, start with the belief that a security bug always exists. It's just a matter of finding it. As a corollary to this, attackers don't assume anything. An attacker never assumes all login pages are secure or that the default password isn't password. The only assumption a successful attacker has is that somewhere in some manner, the system can be compromised. Finally, successful attackers will be resourceful. They'll find shortcuts, lower cost alternatives, etc. to achieve their goals. Getting expensive probes and equipment isn't a problem when they sell for a fraction of the original price on eBay. Attackers may sift through dumpsters at vendor facilities to recover discarded documentation or prototype samples. One industry security researcher disclosed during a security conference that he gets access to one of the world's recognized supercomputers because his wife works at the computing facility. Another industry security researcher mentioned how he reverse engineers the dyes of depackaged circuit chips with a tunneling electron microscope. Now, he can't afford one personally, but for the cost of some pizza and drinks, he can entice graduate students to access the one at the nearby university on his behalf. Let's take a moment for a special topic. Don't speculate on attacker motives. 
We commonly hear, why would anyone do that? Or, I never thought about that. It's important to recognize that lots of people do things for lots of reasons. It's not our job to worry about why attackers will want to do what they do. An attacker can be motivated by curiosity, desire for fame, boredom, cyber activism, whatever. So don't spend time on the why. Instead, focus on the how. In other words, focus on what happens if I do this, not why would I do this. The bottom line, just assume someone, somewhere, will try to attack your product. Since it's too difficult to try and identify what attacker's motives may be, and the possible motives are too numerous to ever get a complete handle on anyway, your resources are better spent on understanding what you need to protect and building security measures to protect them. As you see listed here, when attackers begin to find ways into your system, typically they are seeking to gain access and control, to increase their privileges, to recover or access resources, to deny access to others, and to maintain and hide their presence in your system. Let's look more deeply into these objectives and their ramifications. One classic goal of attackers is to gain control of their target. In fact, this is the primary goal implied in the classic industry definition of penetration testing. Attackers usually look to get their target to execute some kind of attacker-specified code, which could be delivered by a remote vulnerability that leads to code execution. By tricking a user into running an evil program, such as through an email attachment or USB drive, by loading malicious firmware onto a device, by visiting a malicious website, and so on. Another goal of an attacker is to gain more privilege. Now think of privilege as the ability to do more than you can currently do. Essentially, attackers want to gain more privilege so they have more capabilities that are useful to their security agenda or to enable them to achieve additional attacker goals. A typical example of privilege escalation might be when an attacker uses a non-privileged process to exploit a vulnerability within a privileged process in order to control it and accomplish the attacker's goal. For example, buffer overflows that involve a non-root process spawning a root shell by exploiting a privileged vulnerable application. To understand privilege escalation, you first need to understand how privileges work. Take, for example, the different privileges within an operating system. They are organized into rings of trust, with the innermost rings possessing the highest levels of access to the components running the operating system. In this privilege hierarchy, we begin at the outermost level, at ring 3, which is considered the space in which a user has access to interact with software running on top of the operating system. The rings then progress inward to the kernel level, ring 0, VMM hypervisors, SMM BIOS, and down into the level that interacts with the hardware directly. Another example of privilege escalation could be a simple escalation from a process to a service, or from a regular user to an admin user. There are further privilege levels that are not depicted in this diagram. It's also important to call out lateral privilege changes. While not increasing privilege in the sense of moving up the recognized privilege hierarchy, changing from one user account or process thread to another now gives the attacker the aggregate privileges of both, along with whatever additional resources the other account or process had. Another goal of attackers is to gain access to a resource or asset. Resources and assets come in many flavors, including private user information, passwords and other secrets, protected content, and critical system resources. While an attacker may look to gain control to a resource or asset, they also may look to deny others access to a resource. Making a resource unavailable leads to what's called a denial of service, or DOS vulnerability. To truly be effective, a DOS attack needs to have a notable or lasting impact and affect more than just the attacker. Examples of things that may cause DOS attacks are sending an ICMP flood to the IP of the hosting server, thus tying up all of the server's bandwidth in dealing with the ICMP data, entering input into a web form that causes a buffer overflow and results in the server crashing or rebooting. Confirming a true DOS attack can be tricky, since you have to double-check that the attacker didn't already have the ability to achieve the same effect as the DOS attack. For example, it's hard to claim a DOS vulnerability on an attack that causes the system to crash if the attacker already has some elevated level of privilege on the system to make it unavailable. Although it's true that this does still deny access to a resource, the attacker would now have capabilities on your system greater than only denying access to resources. And as a result, we would classify this type of attack differently. 
We should also note that removing resources themselves via deletion or by changing permissions to eliminate access is also a method of denying access to resources. Lastly, an attacker may want to clean up or hide evidence of his or her activities, such as by deleting log files. Attackers may also try to put the system further under their control by installing rootkits and perhaps patching or mitigating the security issue so as to prevent other attackers from coming in and stealing their turf. A rootkit is a special type of malware that operates at the inner level of the operating system privilege rings. By design, it hides itself and its processes, thus being able to do whatever it intends to do without interference from integrity control processes or antivirus software. It's being mentioned at this point because rootkits are very dangerous pieces of software. They are extremely difficult to detect and even more difficult to remove. Let's review again. What are the traits of a successful attacker? A successful attacker is typically observant, creative, tenacious, and resourceful. What are the goals of an attacker? Attackers typically seek to gain control of the system, increase their privileges, access a resource or asset, deny someone else to a resource, and maintain their control or hide their presence. Now let's look at an important concept, how attackers string together sets of functions and bugs to create a security vulnerability. Vulnerability chaining is the use of a sequence or chain of bugs and functionality in order to arrive at one or more vulnerabilities. Effectively navigating vulnerability chains is a matter of taking two different vantage points. Start at the attacker's beginning state and see where they can go from there. And start at the attacker's desired end state and see what leads there. If an attacker is trying to achieve a certain goal, but this goal is either too complicated or impossible to accomplish given the existing resources, an alternative would be to use vulnerability chaining to exploit two or more relatively easier vulnerabilities, to exploit and combine them to accomplish the same goal. For example, if the attacker was trying to perform a remote code execution attack on a target and it wasn't feasible to exploit such a vulnerability on the target system, the focus turns to finding and combining other vulnerabilities to accomplish the same goal. Let's look at a more detailed example. Imagine we have an attacker who can access a website. The attacker's goal is to cause the web server to run the attacker's arbitrary code. There may be multiple ways to achieve this. First, there may be a direct functionality usable by the attacker that allows them to upload code that the web server will immediately run. Or, there may be functionality that allows the upload of a data file. The file isn't executed. It's just treated as data. However, when looking backwards from how arbitrary code execution could be caused on the website, a local file include issue could be spotted. A local file include vulnerability allows an attacker to open and execute files on the system as if they were code. Local file includes are restricted in that they require the file to be present on the file system already. But by using this vulnerability chain, an attacker can upload the data file, then use the local file include bug to treat the data file as code. So here we linked two pieces of functionality together to make a chain to realize the vulnerability. Not all chains can be fully closed. Imagine the attacker has the ability to upload a graphics file with a .jpg extension. Then, working backwards from the arbitrary code execution, a local file include bug is spotted but only for files that have a .php extension. What the chain lacks is a segment that someone converts or transitions from a .jpg file to a .php file in order to complete the path. An observant attacker would keep a careful eye out for any possible opportunity or functionality to achieve this link in order to complete the full chain. Effective use of vulnerability chains is a matter of keeping track of all the various chain links you have and need. You can do this by keeping a list of all the links, which can be conceptualized as vectors having start and end dates. Then as you progress through your validation activities, you only need to look for new links or vectors that aid in forming a complete vulnerability chain. Let's look at a real-world scenario of working through a vulnerability chain that involves software and hardware. We have an attacker. That attacker is trying to find a way to set the password on a hard drive, which is an industry standard hard drive functionality. By setting the password, the attacker can essentially take the drive hostage and request that the owner pay the attacker a sum of money to remove the password and give the drive and data back. So let's start by looking forward from the attacker's position. We are assuming that the attacker starts with ring zero permission with the OS 
That means the attacker has the capability to run code in the OS and to access the system hardware. Now let's look backwards from the vulnerability end state of setting the hard drive password. A review of the hard drive ATA spec shows that the setting of a hard drive password by a malicious person after the system boots is prevented by using a hard drive password lock. Now they actually call it a freeze, but we'll just call it a lock for our purposes. When the lock is set, no more hard drive password changes can happen. So based on that info, it seems that there are at least three ways an attacker can set the hard drive password. If the password lock isn't set to begin with, bypassing the password lock, or by using some kind of physical access to attach to the hard drive circuits and set a password directly. But let's just say physical access attacks are out of scope. By the way, for the purposes of this illustration, the vector arrows indicate whether we worked forward from a start to end date or backwards from an end to start date. All paths are meant to be logically traversed left to right, that is, attacker to vulnerability. Anyway, let's look at the don't set the lock path. At some point during the system boot, the lock has to be set. Thus, it's a matter of figuring out what sets the lock. Let's propose that it is the OS that sets the hard drive password lock during early OS boot. If that's the case, then if that OS code gets disabled or replaced, then the lock won't be set. But, aha, if the attacker has the ability to run OS code, the attacker will inevitably have the ability to replace that OS code. So now we have a complete path from attacker to vulnerability. But let's say it turns out that this is the BIOS instead of the OS that sets the hard drive password lock. That means that the OS code path is mitigated and we have a new path for BIOS. Replacing the BIOS code can only be done by BIOS SMI code and that would require the BIOS SMI to be compromised. So all we would need is to find a vulnerability that compromised SMI and we could then take the path from there all the way to our hard drive password vulnerability. Alternatively, we should check and see if SMI is in the trust boundary for the hard drive. If it's not, then we start with the assumption that SMI is malicious. That is, the attacker starts at the start state of a compromised SMI. Fortunately, the BIOS is in the trust boundary, so that's not the case. So for the purposes of this illustration, we are not going to pursue the security of SMI further. Let's just call it out of scope. Let's go back to the bypass lock vector. We can infer that an implementation bug in the hardware lock feature would allow us to bypass the lock. A review of the hard drive feature spec also indicates that a hard drive password lock is removed when there is a power reset. Thus, all it takes is a power reset to remove the lock. Who controls the power to the drive? A review of mobile CRB board schematics to trace the power pins going to the SATA power connector shows that the hard drive power plane is controlled by a general purpose I.O. pin of the system chipset. So all it takes is a toggle of the GPIO to cause a power reset of the drive. And the attacker has hardware access, so he can toggle the GPIO. We found another vulnerability chain. Use hardware access to toggle the GPIO which will reset the hard drive power and remove existing hard drive password locks, thus allowing a hard drive password to be set. Actually, this path isn't valid because the toggling of GPIO is mitigated by a chipset feature called GPIO Lockdown, which is another special lock that's used to prevent arbitrary software access to manipulate the GPIO. So it's a matter of looking further into the specs for how the GPIO Lockdown works and the specs indicate that the lockdown can be overridden. Now it's a matter of reviewing what entities can override the GPIO lockdown. It turns out it is BIOS SMI that can override the lockdown. This leads us to a previous start state that we said is out of scope. While looking at the spec documenting the functionality of the GPIO and GPIO lockdown, another nearby feature called GPIO Blink was noticed. Basically, the GPIO blink feature causes a GPIO to turn on and off with a small delay, such as to blink an LED light. That seems to fit the needs of toggling the GPIO. Furthermore, GPIO blink is not subject to GPIO lockdown. It can, in fact, toggle the GPIO, even if GPIO lockdown is set. And lastly, GPIO Blink is exposed as a standard chipset register functionality, which means attacker access to hardware is all it takes to use GPIO Blink. So we have another vulnerability chain to get to our target vulnerability.
The process can continue from here, with additional states being assessed and reviewed and more vectors being added and more mitigations being accounted for. However, hopefully the concept of vulnerability chaining and the process of working forwards and backwards from attacker and attack goal has been illustrated sufficiently. Time for review. What is vulnerability chaining? Vulnerability chaining is the use of two or more bugs, functions, etc. linked together to construct a complete path to a vulnerability. This can be done by starting at an entry point and asking what paths can be taken or starting at the vulnerability goal and seeing what paths lead there. Next we will look at how to go from target inputs to security vulnerabilities. Attacks typically originate outside a target. The common attack entry points for software include all of the standard resource channels such as the network, library APIs, the file system, the environment, etc. Any place where data comes into your application is a place for an attacker to try to enter. Some people refer to this as the attack surface. Similarly, hardware has a common set of entry points too, including CPU instructions, registers, memory, buses, and interfaces, etc. One way or another, you essentially start with an input, also known as an entry point, the login and password boxes on the web form. The concept is to provide the entry point with a stimulus, entering in SQL query commands in the password field in order to exploit a particular vulnerability. The web server doesn't validate the user supplied data and processes it directly as an SQL query against the user's table in the database. If the vulnerability exists and the stimulus triggers the vulnerability, you'll have found the vulnerability or coaxed out an observable behavior that indicates the presence of the bug. The SQL query input is interpreted on the server as true because one does in fact equal one. So the server never tries to see if there's a match for the password, which would result in a true statement, because it already thinks it is true. In turn, it then successfully authenticates that user, in our case, the admin user. At this point, the attacker has successfully logged into your website as admin and has full rights to do whatever admin has access to. This admin user, performing admin type functions available to him, would initially not raise any red flags either thus providing the attacker unfettered access to do as he pleases. In this particular type of testing approach, the security bug is referred to as a weakness, SQL injection bug, and the stimulus is referred to as an attack pattern. There is a direct association between attack patterns and weaknesses. They go hand in hand. Tickling a weakness is often a matter of finding and delivering the right attack pattern to the appropriate entry point. At times, you may also hear this referred to as a source and a sink. The source is the area in which the user can supply data, the username and password fields. The attack pattern, or type of attack, is SQL injection, and the sync is the place in the code where the weakness lies, which is in code on the web application server that processes the user input directly as SQL. You can jumpstart your testing efforts by looking at the known lists of weaknesses and associated lists of attack patterns. It just so happens there are two public databases that catalog software weaknesses and attack patterns, the CWE and the KPEC. There are also two public databases that catalog known software vulnerabilities, the CVE and the NVD. For those of you working on software, you can find a database of software weaknesses in the Common Weakness Enumeration, or CWE, on MITRE.org. It boasts a complex taxonomy of all the different ways software is known to contain a security vulnerability. Here's an example screenshot showing a hierarchy of CWE weaknesses. CWE offers multiple groupings to help navigate and find sets of weaknesses that have common properties or themes, such as weaknesses that affect memory, weaknesses that affect files, and so on. Along with CWE, MITRE also offers the Common Attack Pattern Enumeration and Classification Database, or KPEC. KPEC contains test case descriptions on how to find particular weaknesses. All KPEC entries are correlated and linked to CWE weakness entries and vice versa. And here's an example screenshot showing a hierarchy of KPEC attack patterns. Like CWE, KPEC offers multiple groupings to help navigate and find sets of attack patterns that focus on a certain mechanism of attack, such as abuse of functionality, resource manipulation, data structure attacks, etc. Lastly, there is the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database. This is a database of all the publicly known and specific vulnerabilities in shipping products. 
In other words, it is a list of every product and every weakness that product has ever had from a publicly disclosed perspective. It's a bit like a hall of shame, but it can be used to Intel validation. For example, you can look up whether any incorporated third-party IP has any known security vulnerabilities. You can see whether the version of OpenSSL that is incorporated into your products has known security vulnerabilities in it. Here's a screenshot of a sample NVD search that was looking for all publicly known security vulnerabilities in a popular FTP network service software package. Often an important question comes up. Is it expected that every validator will memorize or understand every known weakness that exists in the world? While it is theoretically ideal for validators to know every possible weakness, there are just too many weaknesses to make that practical. There are 865 software weaknesses alone, and many of those weaknesses may not apply to your target. Thus, it makes more sense for validation teams to have a one-time occasion to go through the weakness lists to figure out which weaknesses apply to their target and which ones don't thereby tailoring the list to your specific needs and reducing the overall number of weaknesses that need to be accounted for. But even that can be a daunting task. If you still don't know where to begin, or the tailored list of weaknesses still is too large to cover given your current resource investment, then you should at a minimum review and cover the top 25 most prolific security weaknesses. Sans and MITRE cooperate to produce a yearly summary of the most common weaknesses, which is available at the CWE website. All software validation teams should be aware of and covering the items listed in the top 25 weakness list. Let's review what we just learned. How do stimuli find security bugs? Stimuli or attack patterns are given to target entry points in order to trigger observable behavior in the target that indicates the presence of a security vulnerability. What is the difference between a weakness and an attack pattern? A weakness is the implementation bug or architectural flaw responsible for the security vulnerability. An attack pattern is a test stimulus designed to exploit or trigger observable behavior for a specific weakness. What public resources exist for software weaknesses and attack patterns? The MITRE CWE database contains a list of weaknesses and the MITRE KPEC database contains a list of attack patterns. Now that we've covered the foundation topics for penetration testing, we'll point out some further resources that can help you in your efforts to learn more. As previously covered, the CWE, KPEC, and NVD databases offer a lot of information regarding software vulnerabilities and attack patterns, which can educate you and guide your security testing activities. And here's something you may find interesting. There are actually some public places on the Internet that offer hacking playgrounds, where you can go to learn about and test your penetration testing skills. The hacker war game sites listed are recommended places to consider. You can also look at write-ups for previous security capture the flag events, where attackers compete in contests to see who can take advantage of the most security vulnerabilities. The Nops Are Us website has many good write-ups as well. Or simply performing a web search for the term CTF write-up will produce a lot of reading results.